what are you doing? I am packing. I'm getting ready for my life as the new Adele. How are you the new Adele? This is what's going to happen. Obama's going to step down as president. Joe Biden, the new president, will appoint him to the Supreme Court vacancy. Paul Rudd will be the new vice president because everybody likes Paul Rudd. Bradley Cooper will replace Paul Rudd as Ant-Man. That means Jessica Chastain will take over as the voice of the raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy. And that means Adele, who worked with Jessica in a movie called The Death and Life of John F. Donovan, would take over for Jessica in the new biopic of Tammy Wynette. And I would step in as the new Adele. Hello, it's me. Uh, Kion. I don't think Adele is a position or title you take over. Adele is a person. Have you checked your calculations? Well, there is a scenario where Kevin Bacon takes over for Ed Sheeran, and I become Megan Trainer. but for that to happen, Kendrick Lamar would have to replace Clarence Thomas. The point is, Greg, there's been a logjam. There was no upward mobility, and now there is. Thanks to Justice Scalia, we are free at last. But you've got your entertainment and government all jumbled up. They're not the same thing. Well, they're... <laughs> you got me that time, Greg. For like a second, I thought you were serious. I was. Whatever. Let these people get ready for a show about life after Scalia. I have to get ready to sing Skyfall tonight at the Kennedy Center for a tribute to Samuel Alito and Rihanna. And now the man in line to become the next Judge Judy... Colin McEnroe. It's not definite that I would be the next Judge Judy. I've been I've been vetted to a certain degree, uh, so it's, there's a good chance. Uh, I, now I want to hear her sing Skyfall, but uh, we don't have time for that because, in fact, uh, as everybody knows, over the weekend, Justice Antonin Scalia uh, died uh, and created even more tumult in the American political process while raising questions about our whether our actual governmental procedure for replacing a Supreme Court justice is so completely degraded that we can't even use it the right way anymore. And and on top of that, a whole bunch of cases, sort of orphaned cases or partially orphaned cases, cases that uh, either must be decided or can be decided uh, and will be decided without the input and without the vote uh, of Justice Scalia. So who do we call to make sense of all this madness? Uh, well, in studio, we have called David Yaloff. He is a department head and professor of political science at UConn, the author of Pursuit of Justices, Presidential Politics, and the Selection of Supreme Court Nominees. So you think maybe you would know quite a bit about all this. And then joining us by phone, uh, Dahlia Lithwick uh, writes about the courts uh, and the law for Slate and hosts the podcast Amicus. Uh, and uh, has actually uh, only recently, within the last couple of days, posted uh, Dolly. It was kind of a supergroup version of Amicus and Slate Political Gab Fest. So it was like Asia or something. It was like, you know, <laughs> all the big rock stars were together uh, talking about this situation and, and shedding some light on it. So, um, so but David, I'm going to start off with you just very quickly here. Uh, one of the things we're about to see is um, a, a debate about replacing a Supreme Court justice that will happen kind of in lockstep with the presidential campaign. This is a little unusual, right? I mean, any president stands a pretty good chance of appointing uh, one, two, or three Supreme Court justices over the course of a term, but that's not really what we talk about during the cycle of a campaign. Well, it's extremely unusual, Colin, and part of the reason is because Justice Scalia is only the second justice to die while serving on the bench, uh, uh, William Rehnquist being the other one just in the last 60 years or so. And so generally, justices time their exits to the court uh, at a time when the court is least likely to be politicized, i.e. not an election year. And so you would very, very rarely imagine a justice actually leaving the court voluntarily during an election year. And you would certainly expect them, if they could choose their timing, to wait till the end of the term after the cases are decided. So, Dolly, we have this kind of odd... Um uh, I wouldn't call it a constitutional crisis just yet, but there's sort of this odd moment at which uh, the, the the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, has uh, has basically essentially said, "Oh, I wish John Stewart were still here, so he could say, well, I think he's not really president anymore because he's <laughs> that's his third third year." And so anyway, that basically that uh, President Obama has no business appointing a Supreme Court justice. That this needs to be done by a more recently elected president uh, next year, um, and. The Constitution tends to say otherwise. But here, here Dahlia, it seems like there's no real referee that could referee this dispute. It's the kind of thing that might ordinarily go to, I don't know, the Supreme Court. Right. It's a game of chicken, uh, sort of, you know, intra-branch chicken. And, you know, there's simply no way to make, you can't force the Judiciary Committee to have a hearing if they say they refuse to have a hearing. Uh, you know, I think to me what's so sort of poignant and interesting about this, and I agree, I, I, I don't call it a constitutional crisis yet, but, you know, you're watching the sort of strange uh, conduct 
of the legislative branch inflecting on the ability of the executive branch to act, and at the same time hobbling the judicial branch. You know, so it's kind of like layers and layers of dysfunction, and it's really, really interesting to see uh, the ways in which we might be looking at a court that is a 4-4 court, not just to the end of this term, which would have been, regardless of Scalia's demise, really would have been a, a term for the ages with the court ruling on everything from affirmative action, abortion, contraception mandate, you know, one person, one vote, all of it on the docket. So this would have been the most extraordinary June in a long time. But now we're seeing the possibility of both this term and next term with a 4-4 court. Yeah, it's still going to be an extraordinary June, just kind of in a different way, probably. Um, so um, one of the things, David, and, uh, you know, I mean, we're sort of veering out of jurisprudence and into politics here, but that's going to be just the way of things probably uh, for the next nine months. But, you know, one one possibility here is that uh, if, in fact, there's no mechanism that can work to, to, to reseat somebody uh, in Scalia's old seat, you, you wind up having this much more heated political debate about stuff. And you, you think about some of the things, I mean, so much of it depends on how it gets it's framed and how the framers, you know, how, how good they are at it. But for the Democrats, I mean, nobody likes Citizens United. Uh, and for the most part, uh, Americans and polls are pretty comfortable with Roe v. Wade. I mean, they can make a pretty powerful case the, that the next president you elect um, could materially affect those two things, plus a lot of other things that Americans have strong feelings about. You know, they can make that case and they'll try to make the case. But the, the truth is we're really in uh, unusual ground here because no Normally, candidates speak a little bit about the Supreme Court, and it generally does not impact uh, uh, votes the way uh, the economy does, the way you know certain extreme circumstances in foreign policy do. Uh, occasionally, we'll see a question or two asked in the general election debates. Uh, Kerry and Bush uh, went a little bit back and forth, but uh, there's no sense that it, ha- it in a normal election year would actually impact voters. Uh, Certainly, it's important to a lot of people, but it doesn't usually swing elections. This is very unusual territory because the vacancy is going to sit there and the politics surrounding it during the campaign, during the primary season. It it, it really is unusual. So, you know, obviously, Dahlia, there might be some way to broker some of this, except that I wonder, and once again, I'm a little asking you to venture a little bit uh, out of your bailiwick uh, and, and talk uh, presidential politics, but it seemed as though even on Saturday night at the debate, the Republican candidates were essentially freezing this position, right? I mean, they're they're saying delay, delay, delay. Don't let this happen. And and you wonder by the time they're through running their mouths about this, how much wiggle room anybody else in Congress, at least any Republican leader in Congress, Mitch McConnell notwithstanding, anybody else would have to say, well, hold on, maybe there's a, another way to get through this. Yeah, it was interesting. I didn't use the debate as the marker because I expected, you know, the sort of high water. Um, obstruction from the debate, but I think that the probably relevant marker is statements that come afterwards from Kelly Ayotte and Ron Johnson, you know, people who are in contested Senate races who may have had reason, as you say, to broker something that looks like a climb down from the most extreme posture. And they have also taken the position that, you know, not now, not ever, not by Obama, no hearings, no vote, nothing. And so it seems to me that you have pretty much a brick wall. And I think when you start with that as your bargaining position, uh, and that's, you know, even in, as I say, you know, uh, states where you might think that a little bit of a more temperate response could have been helpful. It just seems to me that there's nowhere to go from there. Yeah, Uh, I I think that's absolutely right. There was, I think, a small little crack in the wall I saw today or yesterday from Lindsey Graham, who has said, you know, if there was a nominee to be confirmed, even admitting the possibility, it would have to be a quote unquote consensus candidate. And there's actually a very small modicum of history to support that. 1932, Herbert Hoover, who was actually running for president, uh, there was Oliver Wendell Holmes retired at the beginning of the year, and he managed to confirm very quickly Justice Benjamin Cardoza. But this is, you know, one of the great legal lights of all time. Someone who had consensus support on both sides. That's not uh, normally the kind of candidate uh, that president. Presidents put up. 
So, you know, there was one proposal put forward by Jonathan Adler. I'm sure other people have put this one forward, too, but it seemed like something that you could at least talk about, Dahlia, and that would be that President Obama would make a recess appointment of one of the three retired Supreme Court justices. So those are people who have already been approved by Congress as Supreme Court justices. Now, they all, even Sandra Day O'Connor, probably track a little bit too far to the left to satisfy people who want, you know, a perfect replacement for uh, for Scalia. But, uh, but at least they've all been approved, and then the agreement would be no matter who gets elected, whichever side elects a president uh, in in the next term, that president would get Senate confirmation of any qualified candidate, Um, whether or not that would you know, result in automatic confirmation of, say, the next Clarence Thomas, you know, qualified is a very tricky word. Uh, But um, I mean, it seems like that deal can't be made, but I'm amazed that it can't be made. Uh, Yeah, I know it can't be made. And I think, you know, on a completely practical level, I'm not sure any of those three would serve. Uh, you know, some of them continue to sit by designation occasionally, but I, I'm, I'm not sure any of them uh, wants to go back to that even in the short term. But I just, I, I, I guess I feel as though what possible benefit to President Obama of taking away his uh, nomination. And it also seems to me that if the game here is, and again, I'm not a game theorist, mm. that we're going to give uh, Republicans a chance to sort of have two bites at the apple. In other words, we're going to defer a, a fight over this now, but then, you know, th- their long-term risk was meant to be, hey, you know, you could lose in November, and also you could lose the Senate in November, and then you're going to get a Justice Erwin Chemerinsky or Pam Carlin. That's the downside, and I think taking away the downside uh, with no upside for the administration seems to me like it's not really a compromise. It feels a little bit like a hostage situation. Mm. Uh, well, that sounds like a good game theory to me. Let's let's talk about some of the cases that are, they're not exactly orphaned, and, and I think they probably need to be grouped, uh, you guys can tell me, uh, into two different camps, cases that have been heard and cases that were on the calendar to be heard, and, and probably the, the disposition of them or how things shake out will, will be a little bit different. But um, all of them are obviously affected by the absence of Justice Scalia and the lack of any replacement on the horizon. So, um, so I don't know, Dahlia, do you have a particular favorite that you you now feel has been thrust into a, a different light? Well, I would just clarify one thing, um, and, and David can tell me if I'm wrong, but actually there's no difference between the cases that have been heard and the cases that have yet to be heard. The courts heard, I think, about two-thirds of the docket. Um, but it makes no difference. Even if Justice Scalia had circulated a draft majority opinion, the rules of the court are that his vote doesn't count until the decision is handed down. So even if we know how Justice Scalia would have voted in a case that was heard in November, um, the, the whole sort of premise of the drafting and redrafting and circulating of opinions is that people change their minds, right? And Chief Justice Roberts famously changed his mind in the middle of the Affordable Care Act case, the first Affordable Care Act case. So no matter how far along one of those cases that has already been heard uh, has gotten, uh, it's now a 4-4, and that's kind of what it is. Um, the one that is, I guess, most interesting that in insofar as it's clearly, I think, going to flip once you go from 5-4 to 4-4 is uh, a kind of niggling uh, public sector unions case that just had to do with the union fees and how they were collected. It was a speech claim that said that you can't make people uh, pay in to public sector unions, even for non-political activities, because it's a, 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 a encroachment on their speech rights. That came out of oral argument looking as though 5-4, the court was going to side against the unions. If it comes out 4-4, then what happens generally is that the lower court opinion stands. In this case, the lower court opinion sided with uh, the unions, so the unions will actually uh, probably pull out a surprise win in that case. Yeah, you know, back to the whole question of uh, whether they've been argued or not. The only thing that I was thinking here, and I know so much less about this than you guys, that is that that Justice Chief Justice Roberts, with a case that hasn't been argued yet, he could, I, I assume, he could conceivably say, you know what, let's let's delay this until we actually have you know, nine justices to, to rule on it. Let's not hear arguments yet. Actually, actually, Colin, he can even do that when it has been argued. And in fact, Roe versus Wade, obviously one of the landmark cases of the 20th century, had been argued 
And uh, then there was the decision to have new arguments. Uh, we had the uh, two new justices came onto the court in early 1972, Powell and Rehnquist. And so it was actually re-argued with the full court instead of just um, with the seven. So he, he, Ju Chief Justice Roberts, it's kind of all there for him within his discretion to a large degree. Uh, you know, also consider these kind of weird nuances like the Fisher versus University of Texas affirmative action case. That actually was not is not 4-4. It's actually now 4-3 because Justice Kagan and Dahlia, right. please correct me if I'm wrong, she actually had recused herself right. because she had participated. So now it goes from a 5-3 to 4-3 theoretically. Well, that's still a victory, but uh, Chief Justice Roberts might be able to persuade enough members of his court to say, you know what, this is an important enough precedent that we would like five of, a, we would like a majority of a full court. Uh, a four-three is the kind of precedent that might be revisited very soon. So there's so much up at, at stake here. Yeah. So re-arguing is a possibility. It's happened in a lot of landmark cases. Uh, have had re-arguments, but I guess Dahlia, what I was wondering about is, is like something about like the, the uh, something like the Affordable Care Act contraception case that has not been argued yet. I don't think it's uh, called. I think Zubik versus Burwell, but it really is. I think seven different petitions. You know, and, right. And seven so, cases consolidated. That's right. So so if Justice Roberts is looking at that and doing kind of a mental nose count and thinking, wow, this is going to go 4-4. Why even hear it? Why not delay hearing the case? Because even if you, cause if you have a 4-4 deadlock, then you have sort of a splintered circuit, right? You have these, these seven cases coming out of different circuits so that one of them would be kind of passively decided. The other six would be in some kind of presumable flux. The, uh, the argument uh, would be powerful, if you, assuming he's allowed to do it, just to say, you know what? We're not going to hear this thing until I got nine just justices. Well, I think what, what uh, and David's completely right, you know, one possibility is always to hold it over, to have it re-argued. The other thing that sometimes happens, uh, and we've seen John Roberts do, do this before, is when it's a 4-4 split, you can find some technical grounds <laughs> to make it go away, mm -hmm. some small jurisdictional way to kick it away. But the court has to hear what the court has to hear, and so I think when you're looking down the barrel of, again, this may not be resolved by October, this may not be resolved by next January. January. John Roberts has to make calculus, I, I think, has to make a calculus that isn't just turning on the assumption that this is going to be a normal year and he can kick things over to October. I think he has to assume that he's got to have a long game here, and that makes this very, very complicated. It means that some of the correctives that work when you know you're going to seat someone over the summer uh, don't work. So it seems to me that, you know, you are going to have a, a huge problem in a lot of these cases, and no less a person than Antonin Scalia said this at his confirmation hearings. One of the reasons we have a Supreme Court is so that we don't have different laws on different circuits. We need to fix those circuit splits. And so I think that there is this notion floating about that maybe the court could do just fine for a couple of years with a 4-4 uh, uh, ties and everything, but it, it really looks more and more as though that would be very, very quickly uh, something that would make it very, very difficult for the court to really meaningfully say anything about anything. And, and David Yelov, I'm assuming it's a mistake, it's certainly a mistake for me to sit here and think that I, I know what's going to happen. In some of these cases, you know, there, there won't be 4-4 four, four deadlocks. You look at Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, that's the um, the, the abortion case. Um, there, there was a vote on a stay, I think, earlier where there appeared to be five Five votes. It's, it appeared as though, based on that vote anyway, that Scalia, even if he were on the court, would be in a minority of, th of three coming out of that, right? Well, that's absolutely true. Four, and four, think four, about five, four. And the the uh, Affordable Care Act case. I mean, if if Justice if Chief Justice Roberts does what he's done in the past, he might be joining uh, the four moderate to liberals, and again, that would be five to three without Justice Scalia. So th there's there's a lot that that the Chief Justice has to decide. I'm I'm reminded in 1975 when uh, Justice Douglas actually had a stroke while on the court, and he was still serving, but everybody was very uncomfortable with the idea of him participating, and they kind of made a decision uh, within the court that if it's a 4-4 and he's going to actually be the deciding factor, we're going to put that off for a future year, uh, which basically debilitated, obviously, his uh, effectiveness. But, you know, they can work within the court small group structure to come up with something they're comfortable with, and Colin, they are not in a rush. We're in a rush to hear mm -hmm. on many of these cases. They're often not in a rush at all. So, yeah, Dahlia, I, I want to give you time to 
to talk a little bit about the legacy of Scalia. But to, to David's last point, I think it's an interesting one. A lot of this does probably devolve upon the temperament of Chief Justice Roberts. And what we've seen of him from a distance anyway, he looks like a man who doesn't who, who values sort of order, doesn't really necessarily want the court to be issuing decisions that people have a lot of problems with or people get out on the street with torches and pitchforks that that, you know, with the Fisher case with a 4-3 vote, he might not be comfortable uh, having the Supreme Court make a big decision with only seven justices voting or, or something like United States versus Texas. That's the big uh, deportation case. You know, once again, he might, you know, not want this to be a, a super controversial ruling. I mean, he could possibly even join the liberals and on some other grounds like standing or something like that, that that that. When we, I don't know, you know this guy's temperament better, but even listening to you on your podcast, I, my sense is he's not a guy who wants there to be a lot of dangling threads. I think that's right. I think that he is someone who will always put the institutional prerogatives over uh, his own agenda. And I think that he, um, you know, I think I, I heard some. Uh, talk today that, you know, maybe some of the conservatives on the court would be perfectly happy to slow walk this through, you know, the next year uh, and a half. I, I don't know. It's hard to know. I think that, you know, what I triangulate back to, Colin, is is John Roberts' speech. It feels like it was 100 years ago, but it was less than two weeks ago when he gave a major speech saying, like, what I hate most is when the court turns into a political issue. Please do not turn this into an election year issue. And I think that, more than any other thing, is a source of tremendous anxiety, and there is no one, I assure you, more anxious about the court being on the front pages of the newspapers between now and November and having us parse every single thing that they do for ideology and for, you know, sort of uh, uh, underhanded machinations than John Roberts. He would hate what has happened. So that's an easy transition, uh, Dahlia, from there into the legacy of Justice Scalia. So, because, I mean, and he is such a double-edged sword this way, too. In some ways, he's a guy who's constantly arguing for originalism, for having kind of a, a theory of law that he repeatedly reply, uh, applies to cases. But he's also, if, if John Roberts doesn't want the to, court to be seen as political, then Scalia is a problem for him or was a problem for him because so much of his language was supercharged and almost unnecessarily politicizing uh, decisions that, that might have been seen in a much much more calm and restful way otherwise. I, I think that's right. I think that, you know, when we look back on Scalia's legacy, we will say it was a very mixed bag. On the one hand, it's completely clear that he took this kind of slightly murky, inchoate notion of originalism, textualism, you know, being faithful to the original public meaning of the framers. And he turned that into, you know, the sexiest mode of constitutional interpretation that's out there right now. And that was hugely influential. But case by case, uh, if you are looking for what Scalia did that was that was good writing, it was always and inevitably and inexorably in dissent. It was in dissent because he couldn't get five votes, and that's because of the sharp elbows. And, and David, as somebody who teaches this stuff and teaches it uh, on a long look back, I wonder how you think this is going to work out. An argument could be made that people will forget all the argle bargles and, and you know weird uh, uses of language and some of the really intemperate speech and, and maybe even the you know the crypto racist uh, observation he made in the in the Fisher case recently about how s black students should go to slow schools. And maybe people forget all that stuff and just see the stuff that materially affects the law, which Dahlia is saying maybe isn't even as big as we think because he, he really wasn't necessarily somebody who, who could get five people for a majority opinion. But uh, 50 years out, how does Scalia start to look? Yeah, he, he was not the most strategic justice. I mean, you know, contrasting with someone like Bill Brennan, who he, he liked personally, but uh, uh, the notion of looking beyond the case at hand to how this is going to affect the future, th this was not Justice Scalia's expertise. In fact, I think it's been said several times in recent days that he sometimes uh, put up on a silver platter arguments for the other side in the famous Lawrence versus Texas case uh, where the Supreme Court overturned an earlier decision and said that uh, you – that, that – that, that, uh, the right to uh, homosexual sodomy is something that's implicit within uh, the core right to privacy. Uh, Scalia went on in dissent about if you say this, the next step is same-sex marriage. And voila, lower <laughs> courts actually looked at his dissent and said, you know, Justice Scalia says that's the next step. We, we actually think he's right. I do want to just say... Uh, uh, Colin, though, it's so important to understand just because he's in dissent and sometimes very 
colorful in dissent doesn't mean that he was necessarily wrong. And history has sometimes shown his dissents to be right. I mean, I, I, one of my favorite opinions of Justice Scalia's was his dissent in Morrison versus Olson, the independent counsel case. And he, he spoke eloquently about how uh, the independent counsel w- could run amok and be abused. And guess what? Both sides, Republicans and Democrats, ended up agreeing and letting that law go away. Uh, sometimes in dissent, you can be right. So, um, Dahlia, as somebody who covers the court in real time, there's going to be another part of you who thinks, wow, I got so many great articles out of this guy. I got so many leads, you know, for my stories out of this guy. I mean, I assume you're going to miss him in a certain way just because he made your job more exciting. You know, I really am, Colin. And in fact, I'm going to jump off this call right now just because I have another one backed up. But I, I think I wrote in my obituary, my original obituary, I said 15 years ago when I started covering the court, uh, I said, if Scalia ever leaves, I'm leaving too, because there would be nothing left to write. And here I am three days later, still feeling very much that way. Yeah, well, don't don't follow that instinct. But thank you very much for enjo- for joining us. I know it's a very busy uh, time for you. You're much in demand. We're going to take a break. David's going to be with me. We're going to have a little conversation about how people are discussed just generally after they die. David and I all, all will also be available to take phone calls from you in the third and final segment. I've just read an opinion by Scalia. Now the Second Amendment will never be the same for me. For a brief second there, I thought Betsy was talking about the wonder of lacrosse. I was thinking, why would they be talking about lacrosse? It was well, anyway. It's not all right. I know now. All right, uh, we're talking about uh, Antonin Scalia, uh, the vacancy that he's created. Uh, David Yaloff is with me for the whole way here today. Uh, he teaches this stuff: uh, political science and uh, constitutional law at UConn. Uh, he's the author of *The Pursuit of Justices: Presidential Politics and the Selection of Supreme Court Nominees*. And towards the end of the show, if you have very specific questions about how all this works, as the book title would suggest, David. <laughs> It's a very good person to ask about sort of how this whole process uh, does work, can work, is going to work. Uh, but I wanted to pause for just a second uh, or, or at least venture away for a moment uh, from jurisprudence and politics and just sort of talk about how we talk about people uh, after they die. This, is, this comes up more and more uh, these days, as uh, particularly as the, the digital platforms allow people of all stripes and of all temperaments and in all kinds of moods uh, to sound off when someone dies. And I, it may be my I'm aging now and my taste for Molotov cocktails is maybe waning just a tiny little bit because, as I noticed, some of the things being said about uh, Antonin Scalia, although he's not somebody whose work I particularly enjoyed or appreciated, um, there were a number of people writing almost to the effect of, well, he was really a rather horrible man, and it's no great tragedy that he died. And I'm, I'm not really quite ready to go there. So I wanted to talk to somebody who's given this great thought. That would be Anthony Grayling, a master and professor of philosophy at New College of the Humanities in London, England, who's thought about this and, and written about it and has written his own uh, uh, piece in the in the wake of the death of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so first of all, uh, welcome to the conversation. Hi there. How are you? Uh, well, I'm just fine. So could we just talk in a general way as you see what the mores uh, of our culture are, what the rules of civility are? Is there any kind of embedded understanding about how we should speak about a person who dies? Is the person who dies kind of morally or, or just by way of good manners entitled to a, a period of good feelings? It used to be thought so um, until pretty recently. And I suppose the long-standing tradition of always uh, speaking with some respect or at any rate restraint about people recently deceased had something to do with the fact that in the past, and perhaps in the more remote past, there was a certain anxiety that if you spoke ill of them, their ghosts might come back and do something to you. But it was also, of course, uh, a quite natural and appropriate sensitivity towards those who were grieving for the person lost. But that's changed. In recent years, I think in the last decade or more, uh, the thought now is that uh, one should voice with honesty the same view of the individual as one did when they were alive, especially with somebody who was um, so uh, salient a person as uh, Antonin Scalia was, uh, who, after all, um, had a very conservative view uh, with a small c about the Constitution of the United States and who offended and upset and in some cases uh, really hurt. Uh, a lot of people, and that made them angry, and they're still angry. 
Right. So one could argue that to whatever extent Justice Scalia was responsible for the coarsening of rhetoric in jurisprudence, then he gets scorched by his own fire uh, after he dies. But I, I still think, I mean, having read what you've written, it, it differs a lot from what I'm reading these days. So I think it's one thing to, to write a piece about Margaret Thatcher saying, well, here are some things that are less than laudatory, that are le- achievements that are less than sparkling, or ways in which her values are really are not necessarily values we would we would wish for many people to adhere to. You know, here are some ways in which I, I, I'm less appreciative of what she accomplished in her time as prime minister. I think there's there's plenty of room to write that piece. And you did write that piece. It seems to me another step down the, the, the ladder towards the lower rings of hell when we start saying, well, this is really a rather horrible man. And, you know, and, and I'm not unhappy that he's dead. Yes, I, I take your point, and, and I think it can sometimes be the case that uh, political opposition uh, to somebody or d- differences of view can really degenerate into personality uh, out of frustration or anger. But in some cases, and I think both Mrs. Thatcher, or Lady Thatcher as uh, she was when she died, and also uh, Justice Scalia, um, both of them gave voice in public to opinions and, and attitudes which were not very far off that same level. I mean, in other, other words, uh, the uh, claim that Mrs. Thatcher made that there is no such thing as society and that we don't owe people in society who are struggling and, and suffering and uh, deprived as much concern as um, maybe progressive things that they merit. Uh, and, and also some of the things that um, Justice uh, Scalia said about, uh, for example, uh, gay people or uh, ethnic minorities really do give concern. And I think that's fueled this idea that if you're blunt in your opposition and uh, dislike even for the principles that somebody lives by and gives expression to, uh, then you should be as open about expressing them after their death as you were before. You know, I don't know how to frame this as a philosophical syllogism, but you could make the argument that the best revenge of all would be to hew to a higher standard uh, than the person that you deplore. That, you know, in all the ways that Mrs. Thatcher might have suggested there's no such thing as society and and whatever the implications of that might be, or in all the ways in which um, Justice Scalia abraded our sensibilities with some of the things that he said, that the ultimate revenge would be, in fact, to, to be better than that and to insist that, oh, yes, there is such a thing as society. And in polite society, we don't say awful things the way you did while you were alive. We're going to say nice things now. Well, I, I very much honor your view. And, and I think that is a, a, a noble and a fine way to look at things. I, I suppose that um, people who do speak out rather briskly in their opposition to the dead uh, are not so much uh, venting feelings about the individual uh, as also guarding against the legacy of their ideas. Because after all, very influential people like Mrs. Thatcher and uh, Antonin Scalia leave behind them a legacy of thought and of influence. Uh, And um, that is a living thing. That is the thing that still uh, persists in society and has an influence on individuals. And I suppose in focusing their criticisms and and speaking sometimes rather unkindly about an individual, perhaps as they did when that individual was alive. Uh, In part, it's a way of focusing their disagreement with those views, too. Well, uh, now, within the sort of realm of of moral philosophy and and theological consideration, one of the things that, 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 at least in in my amateur status, kind of occurred to me over the weekend is, you know, we tend to focus on what sort of treatment that person deserved. What sort of treatment uh, should should I mete out towards Margaret Thatcher, towards uh, Antonin Scalia, toward anybody? What 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 do they deserve from us? But in some ways, you could make the argument that it's actually uh, that we we damage ourselves uh, when we start to depart from some of the conventions that make us better persons, kinder persons, people who are at least willing to let a little time go by, let a dead person fade a little bit into history, uh, acquire a certain inertness before we start stabbing, uh, stabbing them with pitchforks, that, that really the people we're damaging is ourselves by allowing our own sensibilities to coarsen. What would you say back to that? Well, I, I think you may very well be right about that if the, um, the, the stabbing and the attacking and the vilification were uh, um, 
uh, unjustified or excessive. Uh, and indeed, you would be quite right to the only people in the end who suffer uh, ourselves if we do that. But I, I think this is a case or could be construed as a case of people being as uh, forthright and as open about their attitude to um, uh, an individual and that individual's influence and ideas uh, after death as in life. In other words, it would be a cowardly thing to wait until a person has departed the scene before one um, expressed these sorts of views. But if one were expressing them, let us say, in print um, before that person died and continued to do so afterwards, uh, that would be nothing less than consistency. And now, you know, in our very, very polarized world, a very divided world, uh, and we look uh, from this side of the Atlantic uh, with very great affection and concern uh, at, at uh, you guys on that side of the Atlantic, and uh, looking at how tremendously polarized your your politics have become in recent years, um, and, and we see that the, the, the debate can, can no longer be conducted uh, with kid gloves um, uh, always, um, because it lets too many things go by default. So it may very well be a time for plain speaking. Uh, and in the case of somebody with such an immense influence as uh, uh, Justice Scalia had, uh, maybe that plain speaking is justified. Uh, I'm going to let uh, David Yaloff weigh in on this, but I know, uh, A.C. Grayling, that you have theater tickets for <laughs> Tonight. And you've been so kind to find a little time to talk to us. But uh, maybe the, the kind thing for us to do would be to let you get your tickets and find your seat and look at your program. So uh, well, yeah. I'm off to see Hamlet uh, with great enjoyment and uh, not entirely on that No, uh, no, absolutely. Uh, no, I think you'll, you'll find it's a seamless transition. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Bye. That was A.C. Grayling, a master and professor of philosophy at New College of the Humanities in London, England. David, I'm going to throw it over to you, too. And just, um, you know, one of the arguments that I hear about something like this is if you don't argue this out while the topic is fresh, uh, like Dave Zirin uh, said, you know, if you don't argue it out right when Reagan dies, then they wind up uh, uh, naming an airport after him. Uh, I'm not sure that an argument at the time of Reagan's death could have, could have prevented an air airport name. But I take his point anyway, his point being this is the time to have a conversation, even if it's a some somewhat heated conversation about the legacy of someone like Scalia. Well, I, I think that's absolutely true. It's still it's fresh. And more importantly, we have a very, very ready image of him influencing the law. Imagine if he retired at the end of this term and lived another 15 years. We would spend a lot of time talking about his legacy 15 years from now, but it would be completely different. And the other thing to also think about is who's around to help frame it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was his best friend on the court, and she is still around, even though she's four years older than him. And she has spoken quite eloquently in the last few days about his sense of humor, his gregariousness. She enjoyed the give and take and mm -hmm. the stinging comments. And so from that standpoint, having people having people around who can kind of appreciate him in the moment, I do, I do think speaks a lot to a person's legacy and the way they're viewed. Yeah, I, I do think that what's happened now is, I mean, you have those fresh, up-close uh, opinions. What was it like to know this guy, to work with him on a daily basis? What, you take one step back. What's it like to be Dahlia Lithwick sitting there watching these uh, arguments unfold? You get to see a little bit secondhand. And then, you know, two steps, three steps, four steps back, you know, and pretty soon you get to the guy who really... It has cartoonized Scalia in his head that he's just snidely whiplash. You know, he's just this dreadful human being. And one of the either pluses or minuses of digital life is that that guy can get his thing up there and, and get it read. But it's not really. I mean, I, I'm I'm very intrigued by the degree to which Elena Kagan and uh, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg have plenty of time in their lives for Antonin Scalia. Also, keep in mind, uh, former justices often go on; they write books. They're they're often very candid. I mean, very famously, Lewis Powell resigns for, retires from the court in 1987, and then begins to publicly express doubts and qualms about some of the decisions he rendered in five four cases. There have actually been times, Colin, where people where lawyers in briefs argued that's not really a precedent because Lewis Powell has kind of reneged. So, I mean, <laughs> which is which is positively ridiculous and interesting all at the same time. And I say all this because, uh, you know, being able to kind of analyze it in its moment is, is, is so fundamentally important. Frankly, people who are only casually interested in the court are much more interested when something like this happens, even if he had just resigned at the end of the court. It's so different than after you're able to kind of reshape your views in 15 years or so. 
All right, uh, we're going to take a break here. Uh, we, we're trying to leave some time here at the end because you may have your own things that you want to say or questions that you want to ask David. My number, 860-275-7266. That's the number to call. You should call during the break and get on the board. 860-275-7266. Or you may tweet us at WNPR Colin. There's no escape. Everybody's so riled up about Scalia that nobody's even mentioning that Sonia Sotomayor won a Grammy last night in the Latin jurisprudence category. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Our interns are Ross Levin and Stephanie Reef. Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. The part of Bill Curry was played by Sandra Day O'Connor. For show pages, news, and transcripts of the oral arguments in Young versus Hobson, go to our website, WNPR.org slash Colin. Tomorrow, a show about your heart. And now... Back to Colin. Also, tomorrow morning is the Wheelhouse, and uh, I believe we will be continuing some of this conversation uh, at 9 a.m. on the Wheelhouse of the Where We Live show. All right, so uh, we're here with David Yaloff. Uh, he is a department head and professor of political science at UConn. He's the author, very significantly, of Pursuit of Justices, Presidential Politics, and the Selection of Supreme Court Nominees. I said we would take uh, a few calls here. We'll do that in just a second. Uh, I wanted to bring up a couple of things with you very quickly as the calls pile up on the board a bit, uh, David. Uh, one of them is, you know, there's there's an argument being made right now that there should be some kind of term limits that's, that, that, that maybe lifetime appointments uh, are the right way to do this. How do you parse that argument? Well, I think the the most interesting aspect of term limits uh, that people don't think about is erasing justices timing their exits. Because I think what we've seen in the past is uh, Lewis Powell did not want to uh, (laughs) did not want to resign unless a Republican would have a chance to replace him. Byron White held out for a Democrat to replace him. And I think there's something about that that feels uncomfortable for a lot of people that if the justices want to be a non-politicized separate from politics, they shouldn't spend their time thinking about presidential politics. So it would take that out of the mix and would also space out uh, nomination. So you don't have Jimmy Carter getting none and you don't have uh, Eisenhower getting five. You can kind of space it out a little bit more. Um, the other thing that we were just talking about during the break is, I mean, with something like this, like a week makes so much difference. So that, I mean, one of the things that happened right before Justice Scalia died was the court issuing this pretty controversial 5-4 stay, which materially affects coal-fired uh, plants and materially affects the ability, ability of President Obama to keep his promises in the climate change discussions. And this is a decision that would have dropped to 4-4 and kept the EPA regulations or the EPA plan in place. It was controversial, too because it hadn't been heard by a lower court. There was like all kinds of things that made it weird. And it's weirder now because a few days would have made it a big difference. Well, Jeff Greenfield of, uh, of uh, CNN and formerly ABC has kind of made a cottage industry of talking about how very small changes in events become a hinge and change everything. And I, I mentioned to you before that Chief Justice Fred Vinson actually died while uh, during the discussions of Brown versus Board and Felix Frankfurter, who saw a mess arising out of that case, a very famous case, uh, j- uh, wrote in his notes, that that's the first sign uh, of evidence that a God may exist. Remember, Frankfurter was a Jew, but he was a practicing atheist, if that's possible. So mm-hmm. I, I think these moments change everything uh, going forward, and that's what makes it so fascinating. All right, let's, uh, we've got some calls coming in here, 860-275-7266. That's the number to call if you do want to call in. Here's Keith in Canton. Hi, Keith. Uh, good afternoon. How are you? Fine. You taking my call. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, A couple of points. Um, I liken what the Republicans are doing as the playing three quarters of a game and refusing to come out for the fourth quarter for the last year. They're afraid they're going to lose, so they're just going to say, well, we're not going to come out and play. And then also, I also would think of it as in terms of um, kind of as uh, Mark Twain said, is you're entitled to your own opinion. But not your, your, you know, your own facts. Yes, right. Um, your own facts, and what they're doing is refusing to uh, follow the Constitution and even bring forth 
the uh, nomination that, that this president may be forwarding, and I'll take my call uh, answered off the air. Well, David, you, you know, one thing that we're hearing, seeing here, I mean, look, we have conversations all the time when you cover politics, when you teach political science about people, presidents in their lame duck terms, you know, the, the notion that a president in a, in a less denotative way, a president may not have quite the same oomph heading down the home stretch as he or she had earlier. But we've never talked about it this way before. Like, you know, we've never talked about it like, well, you're really almost not allowed to do something uh, in the fourth year of your four-year term. Well, clearly he is allowed to do whatever he wants. But in this instance, the Constitution says the Senate has to advise and consent. And, and you know, this is the same Senate that, you know, obviously they're back to government shutdown at some point. Uh, you know, force them to actually act uh, is not necessarily required of the Constitution. But I will say this. Um, if, if the caller is truly right that the Republicans think they're going to lose the election, uh, it w- the game of chicken would seem to demand that they actually go to Obama and say, if you're willing to appoint a, a more moderate uh, we're we're willing to at least entertain the hearings and see how it might play out. Because frankly, uh, by playing this game, if they think they're going to lose, a President Sanders or a President Clinton is, is going to come in on January 20, 2017 and come in with a nominee much uh, different than anything you could get right now. Right. I mean, there's two different bets that, that they'll essentially be making. One of them is the one that you just described, and the other bet that they're making has to do with the composition of the Senate uh, when they come back. Too. The, their, the Senate seats will turn over. Uh, they may not have the overwhelming numerical advantage that they have right now. And the third factor, a president in his first year uh, enjoys something of a honeymoon, uh, very successful, often uh, making appointments that might not have worked towards the end of a term. So, you you know, there's such a difference between a president coming in, even with the Republican Senate, a Democratic president in in his or her first year versus a president in the eighth year of eight. Um, Based on on all the studying that you've done of this process, I guess the other question that I have is how fast could a new president sworn in next January get somebody seated in the Supreme Court? I mean, how long are we likely to have the fateful eight that we have right now? Well, assuming we we, we stick with eight and the Republicans uh, support their basic position now, which is not even any hearings, um, one would expect that Chief Justice Roberts is going to create a term and a docket that accepts the eight and assumes that there's not going to be more than eight. And from that standpoint, you're not going to have a kind of a rush out of the gates. January 21st, I'll give you the nominee. They're going to want to spend some time on it. And probably the appointment wouldn't come till the end of the term, uh, June, May or June. And uh, the hearings would be in August or September. That's generally the way it is. So you're looking basically at a year and a half um, without a replacement on the court. Wow, that is uh, that's a long game. All right, so we've got a call from uh, Doug here in New Haven. I think this goes back to the conversation about what you say when somebody died, someone you do, you do not hold in high esteem. Hi, Doug. Hi, how are you? Fine. Yes, apropos of your uh, comments about whether you can speak ill of the dead, my mother was a very proper uh, wasp, um, and she was reluctant. Oh, dear. I think silenced. her mother might have interrupted that <laughs> phone call. Right, mother. Uh, we've also got a call from uh, Michael in East Hampton. Let me see. Can I squeeze it on here? Maybe I'll just ask it for Michael just so we can, because uh, we're, we're short on time. Uh, did Scalia have any reservations about stopping the, ch- the, the recount, which put President Bush into office? Uh, that's certainly uh, a case in which he played a significant role. There are two cases where... It appears on the face of it that Justice Scalia went against these principles that he holds so dear. One is, uh, you know, it wasn't a case, but his general acceptance of Brown versus Board seems to defy originalism because nobody thinks that the original uh, writers of the 14th Amendment were thinking about uh, school integration. And the other case is Bush versus Gore, where, you know, Scalia was the very formidable federalist who believed in states' rights, who believed in the federal government not intruding, and the non-activist court, and that seemed to go um, a different way. And he did poo-poo that at the end and said, you know, I'm not talking anymore about that darn case. But there really was a sense that that might have been a moment where he was uh, not as willing to hold so much to those principles. All right. Uh, we're going to have to stop it there just because I'm, I'm low on time. I do want to thank David Yela for spending a, a full hour with me today, department head, professor of political science at UConn. you got to get his book, Pursuit of Justices, Presidential Politics and the Selection of Supreme Court Nominees. Well, you can win arguments. Uh, it'll be on, 
a year and a half maybe of of arguments about this. You can win arguments uh, based on what you find in the book. I want to thank Betsy Kaplan for pulling stuff together today and Kyle and Wolf for getting us on the air and sounding good. I will be back on the air tomorrow at 9 a.m. with Mr. Dan Kosky, and we will talk more about this as well about, as about other things as well, and then join us in the afternoon. Everything that your mother taught you about your heart, well, some of it anyway, might not turn out to be true given the state of research right now. The evidence of what Congress meant comes from the terms of the law. Terms that show beyond question the tax credits are available on state exchanges. This, of course, ignores all the numerous reports from those that actually worked on the bill. Words no longer have meaning. Today's interpretation not just unnatural. It's unheard of. Pure applesauce, the summer salts of statutory interpretation they perform will be cited by litigants endlessly to the confusion of honest jurisprudence. Pure applesauce, jiggery pokery. I hope that when Scalia got to heaven, he wasn't too surprised at how few corporations were there and that he didn't tell God what to do with her body. That never ends well.